Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the college. There are the College of College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, there is a uh, announcements period. Second, the speaker will then present his uh, speech for up to an hour. Then there will be a question and answer period, followed by our infamous rebuttal period. There are two rules to the college tonight. One is, first one is no personal attacks, and the second one is one rule at a time. We have a good speaker tonight. And that speaker... You heard wrong. Oh. <laughs> Our presentation tonight, I'm the speaker, my name is Tim, and we're going to be presenting a College of Complexes first tonight. Should I go online or go to a store? Go online. Uh, no, at the store. Like well, we'll see what happens. You'll notice up here first on the first slide that Amazon has, about four years ago, recently opened up a bookstore. And they're the largest online presence around at this time. Seattle, Washington, November 2nd, Amazon opens its first brick and mortar bookstore. The store is mostly used as an advertisement for more of its online offerings. Amazon Prime membership gives you discounts, and if you're not a Prime member, you pay a higher price. Showcases Amazon electronics like the Kindle, the Fire Stick, and the Amazon Echo, as well as other Amazon branded products. Only a short time ago, Amazon was founded on July 5th in Bellevue, Washington. And it was just a short 16 years later that they opened their first online store. Interesting facts you got to know about Amazon. Their fastest order delivery took place when it was delivered in a four pack of Starbucks vanilla frappuccino to a customer in Miami in less than 10 minutes. Amazon's cloud platform is big enough to hold 80 books for every person on earth. On an average, one new book is added to Amazon's site every five minutes. $5.5 billion in book sales, which is about 7% of its annual income. Amazon holds the patent for one-click ordering, which it licensed to Apple. One out of every 10 citizens in the U.S. is a member of Amazon Prime. Every employee of Amazon has his two days off every year working at the customer service desk, including the CEO. Amazon Kindle was launched in 2007, and within six hours it was sold out completely interestingly. It remained sold out until May 2008. Amazon ships 35 items every second. In 2004, the site was down for 49 minutes and the company, and the company missed sales of nearly $4.8 million. Amazon provides people to about 230,800 230, people. Amazon <coughs> sold its first book to John Wainwright who purchased fluid concepts and creative analogies, computer models of the fundamental mechanisms of thought by Douglas Hofstetter. In 1989, Amazon ordered 181 acres of wrapping paper and 2,494 miles of red ribbon to cater to the holiday season rush. <coughs> the site attracted more than $12,000 within one week of its launch. And of course, Amazon now provides 15,000 robots to help its warehouse employees to retrieve items. Oh, that's cool. And it's been growing like crazy. In 2004, they had revenue of 6.9 billion dollars. By the end of 2015, they had 107 billion dollars in annual growth. The next biggest mehemoth we're going to be talking about is Walmart. They are now going online to compete with Amazon. And one thing that was really funny that I found out about Walmart is the champion of solar power. Based in rural Arkansas, Walmart has historically catered to a conservative customer base and embodied customer and embodied conservative values. Its stores have also downplayed alcohol sales and the company even removed alcohol from Jet.com's offices when it acquired an e-commerce startup. It has also long been the boogeyman of labor activists for underpaid workers and using anti-union tactics. 
However, Walmart's environmental policies are much more progressive. The company had 142 megawatts of photovoltaic capacity in 2015 and is striving for 100% renewable energy. At that point, it was the leading consumer of solar power. It has since fallen to number two behind Target. Walmart explains that the strategy lowers our energy costs and is clearly good for the environment, but another benefit is it keeps license prices low for our customers. Yes. Bananas are Walmart's biggest seller. Groceries make up more than half of Walmart sales, so perhaps it makes sense that the company's biggest seller is the banana. The most popular fruit in the U.S., bananas are generally known as the cheapest food at the grocery store, which suits Walmart shoppers who come in for its stores for low-priced staples. The retailer sells over 1 billion pounds of fruit every year, and its success in selling bananas and other groceries has offered something of a moat against e-commerce sellers. Bananas, which can't be squashed or go below 59 degrees, has proven challenging for grocery home deliveries. One report even described how Amazon Fresh was throwing away thousands of extras because they only sold them in bunches of five. Walmart controls nearly 10% of the U.S. sales. Last year, Walmart's U.S. stores and Sam's Club together brought in $365.4 billion in revenue, nearly 10% of all the non-automotive retail spending in the U.S. That figure, which does not include spending at restaurants and bars, totaled $3.72 <coughs> trillion. That Walmart controls nearly 10% of retail spending is evidence that its economy is a scale and shows how big of an effect it has on the rest of the economy, including stakeholders like suppliers, employees, and customers. Not surprisingly, when Walmart raised its wages to $10 an hour last year, oh, wow. a number of its peers followed suit. <laughs> and Walmart is the world's largest private employer. Just as the world's largest retailer, Walmart is also the world's largest employer, with 2.2 million employees around the world. Walmart only trails the Department of Defense and the People's Liberation of China as the world's biggest employers of any kind. Walmart shoots employee base gives it a sizable sway over the labor market and has also made it a target of activists and policymakers over the year. It is also the biggest employer in 19 states, including much of the South. 5% of the population live within a five miles of a Walmart. As more evidence of the company's ubiquity, more than two-thirds of Americans live within five miles of a Walmart. 95% live within 15 miles of one. That explains why Walmart has shifted strategies in recent years and scaled back significantly on new store openings. Instead, it is stepping up its e-commerce efforts, which include its new grocery pickup stations and spending to clean stores and eliminate stockouts to make item, its items more attractive. With the ceiling approaching on its real estate goal growth, Walmart must now fight for market share with competitors. There's a look at the walmart.com website. You can see they're like everybody else, Black Friday deals, drop everything, are here, get them now. That means get into a store, get them online. Where have U.S. digital grocery shoppers purchased online groceries from most recently? In 2017, the black mark there is about 11% to 14%. And in, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, from, bleh. this is a chart of where the grocery money is going. Amazon was number one, Walmart was number two, supermarkets and food stores and other. Uh, the red line, well anyway, I think the you can get it. The is 2017, the black is 2018. Yes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I, so Amazon has lost grocery market share to Walmart. That's exactly correct. Wal Amazon has lost grocery share to Walmart. It's no secret that Walmart and Amazon are a heated battle for online apparel too. Amazon has moved aggressively into almost every apparel, every apparel vertical over the years with both name brands and private labels. Just as major department stores like Sears and JCPenney have crashed. Anyway, who is winning the e-commerce battle? Amazon or Walmart? Two of the biggest retail players are Amazon and Walmart, and their constant rivalry pits them side to side with new offerings and innovation. What company comes out on top? Walmart and Amazon are two of the largest retailers and are now in constant competition. <coughs> Walmart leads in physical space, 
but Amazon dominates online. Both brands have made a serious effort to fill up areas where they are lacking, and the brands match each other in innovation step for step. Competition will get tighter in the future as the lines continue to blur between in-store and online retail. Strategies. Amazon expanded selection of goods, builds warehouses closer to urban centers, and is expanding same-day delivery service. Walmart has the best of both worlds. They have not only the e-commerce site, but they have the physical stores and infrastructure to support it. Equally successful, Amazon's the world's largest and most powerful online selling machine. No physical stores to service its customers, but it now has more than 100 warehouses. Working on selecting its expansion of goods and a supply chain optimized for online commerce that Walmart just can't match. Walmart has massive warehouses. It's improving its online presence and is making a huge investment in online purchases. Soon enough, the success of both Amazon and Walmart will come from the thing. First, it's the wide variety of products that each of them sell. And of course, they'll be ubiquitous soon enough, like the fictional Cogswell Cogs and Spacely Space Rockets from the Jetsons. Mr. Bezos and the owner of Walmart, again, might be smoking cigars in the next few years with it when they get flushed with success. Now let's go back a little bit ways. Sears and Roebuck. What happened to the world's largest retailer? In the beginning, picture America in the late 1880s. The states are only 38 in number. Their total population was 58 million and about 65% of the people lived in rural areas. Only a dozen or so cities had 200,000 or more residents and a yearly national income was about 10 billion. This was a scene then. One day in 1886, a Chicago jewelry company shipped some gold-filled watches to an unsuspecting dealer in Minnesota in a Minnesota hamlet. Thus started a chain of events that led to the founding of Sears. Richard Sears was an agent of the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railway Station in North Redmond, Minnesota. Sears' job as a station agent left him plenty of spare time, so he sold lumber to coal to local residents on the side to make extra money. Later, when he received a shipment of watches unwanted by a neighboring Redwood Falls jeweler, he was ready. Sears purchased them himself, sold the watches at a nice profit at other stations up and down the line, and then ordered more for resale. In 1886, Sears began the R.W. Watch Company in Minneapolis. In the 1890s, Richard Sears was a genius in the new mail order firm. He knew farmers understood their needs and desires, Better yet, he could write advertising copy that made farmers send in their money and orders. While the earliest catalogs feature only watches and jewelry, the new firm by 1895 was providing a, producing a 532-page catalog with many other items. This book offered shoes, women's garments and millinery, wagons, fishing tackles, stoves, furniture, china, musical instruments, saddles, firearms, buggies, bicycles, baby carriages and glassware, in addition to watches and jewelry. Under Sears' leadership, sales in 1893 topped 400,000. Two years later, they exceeded 750,000. Selling, advertising, merchandising, these were Richard Sears' talents. Not organizing the company so it could handle orders in, on an economical and efficient basis. That was left to a Chicago clothing manufacturer, Julius Rosenwald, who bought into the company in 1895. The company's reorganization resulted in Rosenwald becoming vice president. Sears retained the presidency, suffering from ill health. Roebuck resigned, although the company still retained his name. In 1901, Rosenwald became treasurer as well as vice president. Five years later, needing additional capital, Sears and Rosenwald for the first time sold common and preferred stock on the open market. The company has been publicly owned ever since. In opening retail stores, which happened around uh, 1906, thereabouts, we do comparatively <coughs> little business in the cities, and we assume the cities are not all are not at all our field. Maybe <coughs> they are not, but I think it is our duty to prove that they are not. Nineteen years later, this time Sears Roebuck Company, to prove the cities were its field, the man who proved it was Robert E. Wood, then a Sears vice president, later to become president and board chairman. At Sears, 
he garnered the fame as the father of the Sears retail explosion. There are several reasons why Wood crusaded for Sears to open retail stores. For one thing, chain stores were beginning to blanket the country and cut into Sears mail order business. In 1914, there were about 24,000 chain stores. Fifteen years later, there were well over 150,000. The whole face of the country was changing. With cars and modern roads, Sears rural customers were no longer too limited to shipping by to shopping by catalog. Just as important, American cities were growing up, and Sears rural customers were abandoning the farm for the factory. In 1900, rural populations still outnumbered the urban population. By 1920, that situation was reversed. <coughs> City dwellers would reason weren't good catalog customers. They shopped in city stores. Unless Sears opened stores on its own, it would end up serving only a small fraction of the total American buying public. As soon as he would, on the as soon as he was on the job, Wood moved. Early in 1925, he experimented with one store located in the Chicago mail order plant. It was an immediate success. Before the year was out, he opened seven more retail stores, four of them in mail order plants. And by the end of 1927, he had 27 stores in operation. The retail operation grew to 192 stores in 1928, to 319 stores in 1929, and 400 stores in 1933. During one 12 month period in the late 1920s, stores opened on the average of one every other business day. When two huge stores opened in one city on the same day, more than 120,000 people visited them within the first 12 hours they were open. As one authority put it, leases can't be signed fast enough, stores can't be ready fast enough, personnel can't be hired fast enough. The principle of Sears buying began to change in the late 1920s. Some mail order merchandise was already being sold under Sears' own trade names. And with the opening of more and more retail stores, volume in these other lines grew rapidly. With this growth, Sears were able to develop exclusively different items to be sold under Sears brand names. This is the beginning of such names as Craftsman, Kenmore, and Die Hard. In 1931, retail sales topped mail order sales for the first time. Sears accounted for 53.4% of more than 180 million. Despite the recession, Sears continued to open stores during the 1930s when war broke out in 1941. More than 600 stores were operating. World War II called a halt to Sears retail expansion and even forced several close stores to close. After the war, however, Wood resumed his expansion program. In the 1930s, well, just as Wood recognized the need to open retail stores in outlying areas, so too did he recognize the average family's need for automobile and low-cost insurance. Allstate Insurance Company was launched as a wholly owned Sears subsidiary in 1931 and Wood became its first employee policy holder. It was, its name was taken from Sears line of automobile tires. At first, Allstate operated only by mail. By 1933, management discovered that most sales are being made in small towns where the catalog business was big, while the large metropolitan markets were not responding. As a result, Allstate pioneered the bold idea, the installation of sales locations in Sears stores. As a side note, my grandfather in 1936 became an Allstate insurance agent. And he often said during the war that there was gonna be a boom in automobile and automobile insurance. And sure enough, after the World War II, he was right. I remember having him as being in a somewhat of a doctor's office. Somebody would call him, they'd have an accident, he'd be, go out to do an adjustment. He put in some time at his Sears store, and he was always selling insurance. His major marketing strategy was he'd come into a town, like Elgin, for example, and he joined every organization in town, dressed impeccably, and did what he was told on the organizations that he was with, and they all knew him as a local insurance agent. He retired from selling insurance when he was 63, and he enjoyed a 30-year retirement until he died around 1994. 
Sears Expansion. Generally, a comprehensive code of retail operating techniques was worked out, enabling store managers to concentrate on sewage essentials, selling and proper ordering. The new techniques were as vital to the as were as vital to retail as the on-time schedule system was for mail order. Another milestone was passed in 1932 when Sears established the first established a store planning and display department. Before merchandise had been fit into buildings, now buildings were built around merchandise. The first store to be built from that inside out was the Glendale, California store opened in 1935. The new store planning and display department concerned itself with all elements of the store. Tables, fixtures, space requirements for the different merchandising lines, customer flow and width of aisles. The store shell was built around the selling floor plan. When Sears opened its first, its Pico Boulevard store in Los Angeles four years later, a rival merchandising executive played tribute. In my long experience in the retail field, he said, I have yet to witness a retail unit which equals Sears Pico in practical efficiency, merchandise engineering, operation layout, and presentation of merchandise. Another important approach to urban customers is made through catalog sales desks, which were installed in their retail stores. In another move, Sears opened catalog sales offices in town too small to support retail stores. Two decades later, the company launched an additional catalog and firm operation, the Independent Merchant Program, in which a person operates his or her own store to sell Sears merchandise. In 1942, the company opened its first store in Havana, Cuba, its first permanent retail outlet in a foreign land. But due to shortages created by World War II, refrigerators, stoves, washing machines, fans, all the hard lines so familiar to Sears stores soon disappeared from the new Havana store. In 1947, with war shortages disappearing, Sears opened a store in Mexico City. In subsequent years, Sears opened stores or sales offices in Central and South America and Europe. Sears divested itself of many of its foreign retail operate. I'm sorry, in the early 1980s, Sears divested itself of it, many of its foreign operations. Sears' expansion south of the border was matched in 1953 by its expansion north of the border. Sears joined a pioneer Canadian merchandising group, Simpsons Limited, to form Simpsons Sears Limited, the Canadian subsidy now, is now known as Sears Canada, Inc. In 1969, Sears planned to build a new headquarters building in downtown Chicago. The 110-story Sears Towers building became the world's tallest building at 1,454 feet when it opened in 1973. A staggering amount of materials needed to construct the building included 76,000 tons of steel, 2 million cubic feet of concrete, 16,000 tinted windows, 1,500 miles of electrical wiring, and 80 miles of elevator cable. From about the 1980s to today, Sears Roebuck and Company announced the formation of a corporate office and plans for major restructuring. This resulted in the renaming of the retail business, the Sears Merchandise Group, and the insurer's business, Allstate Insurance Group, early in 1981. When Sears acquired the Dean Witter Reynolds Corporation and the Coldwell Banker and Company later that year, it formed Dean Witter Financial Services Group and Coldwell Banker Real Estate Group. The following years, Sears formed a world trading strategy. It became Sears World Trade, whose activities were reduced and transferred to the sales Sears Merchandise Group in 1986. The financial strategy worked back then. The corporation, plus the Discover Card in 1985, grew into the 1990s, with revenues reaching $59 billion in 1992. That year, Sears announced again it would reshape the company to give it greater depth and marketing focus and give its shareholders a better return on investment. After part of this restructuring, Sears Merchandise Group reorganized around its apparel, home, and automotive businesses, closed many of its underperforming retail operations, including some mall-based stores. Its unprofitable general catalog operations were closed in 1993, leaving a smaller but successful direct response business. A major expansion of Sears.com in 1999 heralded a new era of enhancing the customer experience through web-based technology. With Sears.com, the company began serving as a single national clicks and bricks, 
resource for researching, buying, delivering, installing and maintaining and repairing the top brands of home related products, major appliances, home electronics, heating and cooling systems, lawn and garden equipment, jewelry and watches, recreation games, power tools, and repairs. That's a lot of stuff from Sears and a lot of history. They were the Amazon of the early century. And they expanded first in mail order, then they went to their retail stores. And they even tried to go online, but I don't think they did it quick enough or fast enough. But they're still out there, and you can still go and get their Black Friday doorbusters and everything else. My own thoughts, though, on the fall of Sears and Roebuck. I think they kind of lost their way with the customer, with more focus on the building of the, of the infrastructure of Sears, on the building of the early Sears Tower in the 1970s, and they missed the big box retailing of Walmart and Target. I also think, and at least according to my dad and some other people who have known Sears for a while, and my grandfather, they said the employee pensions and benefits were a little bit too generous. And I think that Sears may have missed the opportunity for online retailing. They should have been involved in 1993 on it. The other thing is, is that what started all this in the first place? You know, a lot of times we're asked, we've seen a lot of changes around the internet and what has happened to it. But there it is. Samuel F. B. Morse, the first message ever sent, what hath God brought? As much as we are familiar with the internet and the world wide web, this is nothing new. A radical technology was introduced in the early 1840s that really changed the world. It literally changed the world from about four miles an hour to a high speed network. In 1843, Morse and Vail received funding from the U.S. Congress to set up and test their telegraph between Washington, D.C. and Maryland. <coughs> On May 24, 1844, Morse sent Vail the first historic message. What hath God wrought? The telegraph system subsequently spread from across America and the world, aided by further innovations. The world of mail order, package tracking, instantaneous communication of corporations in their remote offices, Government communications, basically, folks, the world sped up. And it sped up to a big high price. This map reveals the status of the telegraph network that has existed in the U.S. in 1853. Only nine years after the first message, by this time only one state east of the Mississippi, Florida, was not connected by telegraph. The legend on the left offers the message rates from Pittsburgh. By 1861, telegraph lines crossed American continent. By 1866, the transatlantic cable connected America and Europe. And the revolution of the telegraph was so thorough that for the first time when they were doing the Civil War, it was being conducted by the President Lincoln from his telegraph office instead of by the generals at a local level and he was able to keep in touch by telegraph. The telegraph made possible many inventions, but I still believe one of the biggest was the mail order industry and the development of the catalog. Sears and Roebuck, our trade reaches around the world. And of course, for all you women, the Morris Illustrated Monthly, near of fashions, you could order gowns online. As a matter of fact, after the invention of the telegraph, mail ordering was possible and shops could get inventory even quicker. And in many cases, women, instead of a dress being handmade, could order them through the telegraph or buy them at a store. The first big fashion house was that of Frederick Charles Worth and the development of haute culture. He was a Parisian known for all those big bustle gowns and everything else. And yes, his brother did get a worldwide system of fashion to order and everything. Now any woman today can order off of Amazon.com shop at Walmart.com or still go to a desire and custom order anything she desires. How many things have changed 
and how much have they remained the same? Now, back to our modern times and what shopping has become. That picture there is what I call the monstrosity of Rosemont. It's called the Fashion Outlets of Chicago, a high-end women's clothing retail store that has these big LED TVs on the side of it that distract drivers as they move by. This uh, thing cost almost, I think it was $50 million or thereabouts. It would be about the cost of a power plant that would be uh, powered by natural gas. And it was done for what? Women's apparel. So you do have a lot of econ power over the economy. The growth of e-commerce. The U.S. Census Bureau claims that e-commerce was the fastest growing sector in 2008. It notes that transactions between manufacturers and wholesalers accounted for 95% of all growth. Big online stores were stocking up warehouse, their warehouses from big manufacturers and then selling the wares to customers online. In 2009 and 2010, the U.S. Census Bureau, according to its annual e-stats, claimed that e-commerce once again grew faster than any other sector between 2009 and 2010. Retailers in e-commerce witnessed their sales hike sharply from the year before, the tune of 17%. In 2009, commerce was ranked was ranking the United States $150 billion in annual, and a year later it was pushing $170 billion. In 2012 and through 2018, the bar was set high. Most recently, the years between 2012 and 2018 were enormous for e-commerce and presents interesting online shop, ship, shopping stats. In 2012, <coughs> e-commerce achieved what it had never near before, the ubiquitous $1 trillion mark. However, this does come with a cost, and I'm just going to focus here a little bit on Amazon's employees and their warehouses. Amazon's army of hundreds of thousands of, of warehouse workers <coughs> and sure millions of parcels are delivered every day during peak. They describe the brutal reality of long hours physical labor, fears about taking time off, workplace injuries, and the pressure to keep the wheels turning even when the weather is treacherous. The publication that made this Business Insider obtained showing figures showing that ambulance callouts for two or three Amazon warehouses in the UK increased during the company's busiest weeks of the year. There were conflicting accounts about Amazon's 15 dollar minimum wage hike. Some workers said the wage boosted benefited them, while others said they were worse off because bonuses were axed. Workers also described an internal currency known as swag bucks, designed to boost productivities during Amazon's most intense period of activity. And of course, Amazon has said it's proud of its graded working conditions, wage benefits, and career opportunities. In other words, it's big. They think they got everything handled, but their workers do go through a lot. The next thing you got to be understand is that uh, <laughs> we have porch pirates. Thick the halls, not the porches. Before you add another item to your online shopping cart, think about how the package can be delivered safely, because porch pirates are out for your treasure. According to a study from Safewise, during the holiday season, Chicago sees the third most porch thefts in the U.S. Chicago is also ranked number six on a list of cities where porch pirates strike throughout the whole year. According to Deloitte, about 60% of the people in the U.S. prefer to buy their holiday gifts online, and e-commerce sales are expected to grow 14 to 18% this year alone. Now I'm going to divert a little bit. You know, how do you evaluate an online retailer? How do you go to a website and really know that they're trustworthy? The first and foremost thing is that they publish their phone number. <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but do they publish their phone number? 
And can you call someone on the phone with questions, either it be about a product or a procedure? Now, how many of you have heard of the BBB.org website? That's the Better Business Bureau website. They have reviews of most of the major, of any incidents reported to them, they'll report it. I remember working for, I don't know, I'll get into that later. But they do publish their cases about customer complaints and how the business is doing and everything else. Everything from the small online retail that's got a complaint. If a complaint's been filed by the BBB, they usually have that complaint online with its resolution. And then, of course, you can check out the reviews on Google and other sites. But the thing is, what happens, and what do you do when something goes wrong with your online order from a retailer? What the first thing fake? they always say is call up the retailer first. What if it's fake phone number? You know, well, the thing, the thing is, if they don't have a phone number, you shouldn't be doing business with them in the first place. Call the retailer first, and in most cases, this should solve any problems. I mean, I've done it myself in the 18 years of working for e-commerce. And be friendly but firm about your problem. And please, as a, as a customer, do not be rude. 95% of problems are usually solved within the first couple of phone calls. And if you cannot get satisfaction from the e-tailer, they, you can do things like open a case to your credit card company, open a case on PayPal. It does take a while, but it can and usually will get your problem solved. Because by the time you get to a credit card company or what they call a charge pack, the online e-tailer has to answer to the bank about the problem. I recently had a guy open a credit card case against me on our online site. He threw out the merchandise because he thought it was too bad. And then he opens a case against his credit card company saying it was not as described. We wanted to get the merchandise back, and but he said, no, you just ought to refund my money. I threw it out. It was defective. But that's another story for another day. <laughs> Remember that when there are online problems, be patient, be firm in what is needed, and please don't abuse the system. I know a guy ordered a 55-inch TV. It took about $155 to ship my truck to him. He opened it up, said, oops, doesn't fit my cabinet, and he wants to return it at our own cost, at, it, at our cost on the company. And he ordered a charge back against it. His solution, box it up, ship it back, and I'll give you credit for the restocking fee. I know, kind of crazy, but, uh, you know, sometimes you're better off buying a television at a local Best Buy or a local TV store. But, you know, it's also convenient to come in. My own story of e-commerce. I come at this from a, uh, a long experience. I had, was in the Navy and did a few things, but about the time I was 35, I had been through two years and six jobs. A little ad opened up and said, online auction house needs customer service help. I went and interviewed at UBID. I, at the time, about 98, when I, when I went interviewed for them, not many people knew what the World Wide Web was. My first interview question was, do you know what we do? And I said, yes, I do get your computer up, and I was able to go through the auction process and everything else. Then they knew I had the experience in a warehouse from a plastic injection molding company. I knew about railroad scheduling and times. I knew about transportation logistics and UPS and FedEx. Within a week, I was hired. And I was there for about on and off for nine years. They did lay me off in 2003, but it was rehired back in, until 2009. Since then, about a month after my second layoff from you, but I went to a company called um, goodisnewelectronics.com. It's real business name. is That's what we do business on on the web. And I run the eBay account for them. And I've been doing so for about the last nine years. Um, I saw the site open up. I We also, my boss Anthony also opened up a uh, site at amazon.com. We've since grown. I don't really want to get much into the history of it because I don't want to give out a lot of confidential customer history or whatever he said. My point of the matter is I've been doing this for a long time. The world of e-commerce 
would have shocked me being involved in it in high school, but at 35, it was really the first time in my life that I found a job that I liked, working with technology that I liked, and offered a, a real chance at a corporate job for the first time in my life. So it was a good thing at that time. Since then, UBIT's gone through two iterations. They grew to be like the third largest retailer online. Went kablooey, had another IPO, started growing again. New CEO went kablooey because of HUD. And now they're no longer, they're, they're a mere, mere, mere shadow of themselves. They're now owned by Sky Auction. And no more employees with you, officially with UBIT. Why would anybody want to shop online? Well, first off, it's convenient. There's no time and no traffic to deal with, and you get your stuff right away after you click it. It's delivered to your door. You have a wide selection of what you want, and if you want to order discreetly, you can certainly do it. I mean, you don't want to go to a, a, a department store and buy your uh, Depends undergarments. You can get them online and have them delivered in a plain box, or if you're like in some of the others in that, what they call porn industry, it's discreet. It comes in a plain brown box. You can get away with your stuff. Why shop at a store? The big thing about shopping at a store is you can see and feel the merchandise. You can talk to a real salesperson about the products and merchandise. And after you leave the store, you have exactly what you want. All I can say is, keep calm. This is the end of my presentations, and you may ask questions. Okay. Yes, Karina. Uh, I was curious, does Amazon use RFID as much as Walmart, or do they use RFID? Oh, yes. They, they use RFID and, and, and other things for it because they keep probably keep better tabs on uh, inventory than Walmart does because of their warehouse. I mean, when you're ordering stuff and putting it in the basket and they don't want to make mistakes, the RFID chips help a lot faster for What's an RFID? Radio, radio frequency identification. Basically what happens is the package has a little transmitter in it or goes past a scanner. You don't have to read a barcode, it just scans it. Uh, it has a unique signature from a certain unique frequency. Mm -hmm. Your iPass uses the same yeah. technology. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, yeah, it's a transponder, and it uses RFID. Instead of having to find the the barcode, you just get within radio range of it, <coughs> and it, it tells you what it is. Thank you, Paul. Um, and a boy, Paul. Want to stand up so we can see you and, and whatnot? Go ahead. Uh, did, how, did your research into the history of Sears, uh, did you come across their concentration of stores within malls? How that affected their business? Yes, uh, yes, I did. Uh, the thing is, is that there was so much material, I literally had to cut this speech down by about two thirds. Oh. So, just because there wasn't a mention of of a topic, and, 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 it, and the thing doesn't mean you're not familiar with it. Uh, again, I, I just think that Sears did, did some things. Okay, next. Uh, does that answer your question? I just, well, uh... Do you have some thoughts on it you'd like to present real quick? Oh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on it. Okay, so well, you my, didn't mention it, if you didn't... Well, the first, shopping, the first shopping center was done in Oklahoma City. I think it was in the early... 50s when they first did it and the first mall has been I'm forgetting my stats on the malls but they came into real popular vogue in the 1970s and early 1980s because you know the retailers were still uh, you know they weren't wanting to get out of their car and, and uh, go shopping and they thought they could make it more of an experience and we all remember the growth of malls in the early 1980s and how high school kids would hang out there and everything else and, and it was a good experience for a while. If you even remember, they had those outdoor malls for a while, and, the, and, uh, and no they would way. shut traffic no down. Way. It became disastrous to some cities in the, in the United States. The mall was a good idea because most people who were doing large shopping at the time were looking for a destination, and the mall provided some form of entertainment besides. 
But on the other hand, you had to walk out from a long parking lot into a mall. You couldn't just get in and get out with your merchandise. It was more of an experience for holiday shopping, for going to a movie. And I remember many a times as a kid in the late, early 70s, we would go to Woodfield Mall just to people watch sometimes. <laughs> and now, surprisingly, in some of the more Mexican areas, the malls are coming back. We have one in uh, Dundee, Illinois. It's got a bookstore. But it's mostly filled with a lot of yeah, independent. Yeah, the mall's starting to fill. They're not doing well. Uh, you know, yeah. you're talking about Spring Hill? Yeah, Spring Hill. I, I it's on its way out. Okay. Well, one bullet time. No, that's okay. You can talk yeah, about Spring Hill. Not. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, I hear there's a, a day that's called uh, Quiet Nothing Day. Do you know anything about that? Um, I've heard about it, but I don't, I'm not familiar with Buy Nothing Day. It's about, I've been around for about 20 some years, and it comes and goes, and it, it was done by advertisers for fun originally. Yeah. It's not like Singles Day in China, where it's the largest online retail day in the, in the world. You buy yourself a gift because you're single. <laughs> their, their site hasn't been updated in two years. Uh -huh. All right, next question, please. Yes. Uh, in your own experience, uh, did you notice something slowing down in CS stores? And that was about, what, 75? My own experience with, with shopping has been this, okay? I can remember about 10 years ago, walking into Fry's Electronics in, in uh, I think it's near, uh, it's near Lombard. And uh, they're the largest, one of the largest electronics stores in the world, in, in, in the United States. If you go to Best Buy, that's like a local congregational church. If you go to Fry's, it's the cathedral. Thank you. You can find anything at Fry's. I recently, about five months ago, went down to Fry's and uh, to buy a computer. I did it because I needed one and I didn't really want to screw around with online ordering. So I went to a store and bought a computer and it works and it's pretty good. But I noticed that I was shocked because about half the store shelves were bare or needed merchandise and Fry said, oh, we're having trouble with our with our uh, supply supplier and getting our equipment out because some of, some of their drivers and stuff are on strike. And they said, how could an electronics store be out of product? And then it occurred to me, well, maybe most of it's going online now. You know, for example, I need a 14-foot cable, VGA cable, and I can probably buy one on eBay for about eight bucks and have it here in about four days. And as a matter of fact, that does bring up a neat story. I was working at Ubit for maybe eight, nine years. I got into the video habit and started buying DVDs at the store because I was making them with a duplicator and everything. And I remember I spent a night, maybe once a month or something, going to the various stores, trying to buy DVDs and pricing them out. And then one day I'm sitting here in the middle of Randall Road at Algonquin. One store's got them for 40, one store's got them for 15. And I said to myself, why in the hell am I doing this? Don't I work for an online auction store and maybe I can buy the stuff online and not have to go through this hassle? And I've been working for one for years and I was still shopping the old fashioned way. And it takes a little time sometimes before you get with the new stuff. Placed an order on eBay within six days. 12 pack of uh, 100 DVDs for about 50 bucks. Less than 10 bucks per 100 came to my door. Yes, Charlie. There were protests by the employees in every country in Europe yesterday. There were protests in New York and other portions of the United States yesterday against Amazon. And you seem to have missed all of this and say, well, they're just working okay. They get nice jobs in the warehouse. Okay. Why? And we had the warehouse workers for justice mm -hmm. that were here. And 
you kind of glanced over this. Okay, I'll explain that, Charlie, because we've had a lot of coverage under the Warehouse Workers for Justice, and I am also very aware of the trends in the abuse of Walmart workers and uh, Amazon workers, and I'm not saying it's all there. Again, I had a speech that was about that I had to cut down by two-thirds, and that was one of the things I did not include in, a long, in longer detail because of the time allotted. I thought it was more important to get the general story about Sears and Walmart and Amazon. Important. No, they're important, well, but it's off stuff topic. topic. It's, it's One fall at a time. <coughs> Charlie, the treatment of employees is important. Is that important to you? No, I'm not saying it's not important to me, but I had a lot more material, which is okay, more important. Well, I thought possibly we never really heard about the company histories before at the yeah, college. That's how to buy shit. Well, yeah, that's how to buy stuff. But you got to understand, Sir Charlie, this isn't this isn't the fault of any corporation. No. This is not. No, you buy your stuff by the dollars you spend where it goes. If this is what the consumers want, the only reason Amazon's so big is because people buy from them. <coughs> the only reason Amazon's so big is they buy from them. And the best way to get a corporation in mind is through boycotts, protests, and yes, even your unions that help work and keep those employees' grievances under control. If you want my true opinion of it, Walmart should have been unionized. So should Amazon. Where are your organizers? Where are your, where are your other people to get them organized and get some decent wages? It's their fault. It's not their fault. But I'm saying you know, if you're a union man, you should be out there organizing a little more. No. And I, I know that, and I also know too that there's a lot of problems with corporations preventing unionization from happening. But I'll tell you something else. Without the employees, the businesses go down. Look what happened when UPS goes on strike and how the nation gets affected. Uh, do you have any other questions, Charlie? Like I said, it is an important thing. And Amazon under public pressure did go to $15 an hour. Um, Walmart did go to 10. It does work in certain places. And uh, now that the economy and employment rate has gone down, working conditions and pay have generally gone up for a lot of people. Okay, yes. You kind of pointed it out to, to Charlie. I just wanted you to kind of reiterate how Amazon took the initiative where a lot of companies don't and actually increase their wages uh, where other companies don't. So they're actually, you know, that's. You know, that's not the same as exploiting your worker. Well, the thing, the thing is, is that um, Amazon was trying to avoid a public relations scare. If Bezos had not had the eye of public relations firms or the media on him at the egregious conditions in his warehouse, he never would have raised workers' wages. Well, you know, the one thing that most big companies do, like Walmart and others do, is they had, they control costs. And that's exactly what was happening in the late 1880s, 1890s. The world was undergoing major change back then. But most of your major corporations were focused on costs, trying to keep prices down. And they, the thing that has changed between the 1890s and today is people are valued more than they were back then especially now because of demographics. Um, our population is aging, uh, and within a few years, I think we're going to be paying immigrants to come here instead of disparaging them. Next question, yes. What do you see as the ethical responsibilities of the consumer? Where um, the consumer, that's a good question because, you know, I don't myself, when I go shopping, you know, I just go, I like Walmart. It's quick, easy, convenient, cheap, and I don't really think much about their employees, but I know somebody who, whose wife works for Walmart and is... His ex-wife. Your ex-wife, I'm sorry. Um, she works for Walmart, and... Uh, They're she, capped at 14 an hour. She's capped at 14 She's capped at 14 50 an hour, and she's been there how many years? About 15. About 15 years. And uh, that's not a good thing. But, you know, whether I go to Walmart or not, um, the ethical decision says you should buy local, but 
Thank you. Am I willing to pay twice as much sometimes? Um, it's a convenience thing. I can get out of my car, walk into Walmart, maybe, maybe take me 20, 25 minutes to get my basics for a couple of days, and then I walk out. It's located on my, on my way home from work. Another one I use is Aldi, which has a lot less employees, but I've heard pays their people a lot more. They start at 14. And, you know, they start at 14, as Paul said. And I go there a lot. As a matter of fact, I have a niece whose husband works as a regional manager for um, Aldi, and they just put him on a management training program in London, England, and they're both doing very well because of the company. But he's also been with them since he was 16 years old. So there can be some good that comes out of a corporate corporation, you know, with, as far as the opportunities. You know, I still like where I'm at now. It's a small business of about 13 people, but and it suits me just fine because there's not there's stress when I'm on the job. When I'm off, I have weekends off. I have st steady hours, and, and it's been just steady. I'd like to make more, but well, that's something that will come down the pipeline. Uh, next question. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether you haven't mentioned about this company, but uh, okay. this was way before even uh, email and uh, computers and all that. Do you, do you have any idea why did uh, Montgomery Ward went out of it? Um, Montgomery Ward, Macy's. I Macy's. didn't do much research on Montgomery Ward, but I can tell you that as Montgomery Ward was closing its catalog headquarters, UBID was hiring those very workers. We had one guy. He brought 14 people over from Montgomery Ward to UBID to serve in their customer service department. And I then remember, as they were referring him as a job candidate, and he had 15 people, there was some quibbles from management all saying, this guy should be making this much money on referring people to us. This is supposed to be, they get help with all these, and you know what was said from me from a couple other people, I remember an argument on, as I was passing the office, this guy shouldn't be pulling in this much for putting in these many employees, we need to put a cap on it, and the other guy saying, no you shouldn't, this is an incentive program, and if he's choosing to use it, let him use it to make money, isn't that what, what we're here for, those employees are good. Um, Montgomery Ward, I honestly don't know why they went out of business. I know they had a catalog business, they had a store. But like anything else, things change over time. They, uh, uh, <coughs> let's just say this. For a company to last as long as Montgomery Ward did, or Sears, is incredible. I mean, you know, they build up these big structures because most businesses don't last that long. And it's, you know, um, hard to, you know, keep things going. I mean, and even today, businesses can get great big time, you know. It was only in 2007, 2006, 2007 that Facebook launched. It's now one of the world's largest companies. Google launched back in 1998. It's now the leader in search. Microsoft was the first to get into the personal computer revolution business. And there are far many others that have success stories. But with any success story, you're also going to have those companies that fail, that go bankrupt. Whether or not you like capitalism or not, it's still the best way to make wealth. It's still the quickest way to innovate. But at the same time, it's also the quickest to go bankrupt, to destruct. And it's all subject to the human foibles of the owners and its managers. If they're nimble and quick and they can keep investing on what they're doing and keep their noses working and looking at trends, they're generally going to stay in business. If they don't, they're eventually going to be outcompeted and go out of business. It sounds cruel like survival of the fittest, but on the whole, I think we Americans and the rest of the world has benefited from capitalism and world trade. The rest of the world now, we've seen such a drastic reduction in poverty around the world that within 10 or 15 years, uh, it will almost be non-existent around the world where you have abject poverty, unless you have the rise of socialism and more of the uh, 
authoritarian dictatorships are happening to be coming in. But at the same time, the world is really upset because they say capitalism is all this stuff, and yet at the same time, how can you tell the rest of the world, oh, it's all great and all good when you're seeing these new companies, but yet at the same time, the plant closes, steel plant closes, and everything else. Yes? If capitalism is no good at eliminating abject poverty, how come the United States has such a huge homeless population? Yeah. Property taxes. Yeah. That is a good question because, honestly, I don't have the answer to it. Oh, come on. Um, I don't mean to get the brains of capitalism, but you can't explain its failures? I can't explain why people are homeless, Charlie. But I can, I can, I do know that um, I had a couple friends of mine who were homeless, and I that I knew for many years. And frankly, a lot of the problem that they had was uh, either number one, he didn't, have, they didn't have the skills to hold down a job, which should have been on some kind of disability, or two, they just refused to get help. They were more interested in staying in their car with their dogs than they were in going to a shelter and getting some real help. Finally, what happened with this particular couple that I know is that he finally got a trailer. And he was able to move into a trailer park. And through their disability checks, they were finally able to make their uh, their payments and, and, and rent and everything else. But it was a real struggle for them to do so. And I don't know what the answer is. Um, I do know that getting homeless, a lot of us are maybe one or two paychecks away from it. We don't make rent, we don't do this. And we can be there real quick. But I also know too that part, it's a lot easier to be working and not be homeless than it is to be not working and homeless. Jobs are out there. And I think what we're missing today is a lot of the old pull up yourself and solve your own problems by your own bootstraps. Now I'm not saying we can't give help. And I'm not saying we're not going to give any government aid because a lot of times when workers are displaced, they will need a temporary help, like unemployment insurance. There will be medical issues that come up. Uh, you need a balance between you know, some form of, of government aid that keeps our basic citizenry alive and free market capitalism. It's not going to be all capitalism, no regulations, and it's not going to be all government and all socialism. Most governments are trying to achieve some kind of balance in between. Sweden went way too far for a while with its benefit system, and now it's going back to a more capitalist system. <coughs> the United States perhaps maybe has too much of a, too much what I call <coughs> crony capitalism, where they don't allow the system of uh, creative destruction or bankruptcy to really pull itself out. We bail out the large banks, and we didn't let them fail. And now we let them keep their stuff during the good times, but we don't let them check out during the bad times like a true capitalist society should do. Yes, what are they going to do with all the out-of-work bankers? Well, eventually they'll get into jobs. Eventually they'll rehire. There'll be new iterations of the same business. And that's called innovation, and that usually is what drives forward economies. Over the long haul, Americans are much better off, as well as the rest of the world, by using the by using what in 1776 Adam Smith called capitalism. And I honestly think it was much better. Yes, Charlie. The people are a lot better off. Do you think $15 is a living wage? Do you raise two kids and have a hacienda? No, Charlie. If you <laughs> don't have kids. This system works. Charlie. What is broken to you? What, what is broken? are you using for malfunction? Charlie. My idea of a malfunctioning economy would be what we would see in Venezuela under a pure socialist system. Everybody is equally poor. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have some benefits or some social safety net that the government needs to do. It should be as minimal as possible, but also provide the greatest need for the greatest benefits. Amazon is a success to you. Yes, it is. Objectively, it's a success. There are problems. Yes. 
What planet? Okay, Karina. Er um, <coughs> Amazon has broken into other fields, Amazon Web Services, yes, uh, and, and branched to, to other services. Mm -hmm. Is Walmart, or has Walmart done any of that? Walmart or is Walmart is just straight retail? Walmart more is straight retail, but they are bringing into other businesses. One of the most profitable businesses for, for Amazon is their cloud computing services, which means when companies, like during the Christmas rush, or, or need that extra computing power, they can rent it from Amazon. A lot of large data aggregators are going in. And Microsoft recently had the, uh, just got into a big uh, government contract with the NSA to help aggregate their data. And as a matter of fact, Amazon was almost ready to file a countersuit saying that the open bidding process was not fair. But, uh, but Walmart is not uh, breaking into those type of... I, from what my understanding is, they're still strictly retail, retail. Okay. but they're going into the online market. And I'm going to see probably within 15 years, the two companies will probably be ubiquitous. Amazon's opened up some bookstores. They've opened up online groceries. Through. Is Amazon movies? Well, Amazon will be probably more like uh, Sears was. And uh, Walmart is probably, as its re retail goes more, they're going to get more into web services. And ideally, like I said, Spacely Space Rockets or Cogswell Cox. I don't think I've answered your question that well. No, you but Walmart staying strictly in retail, right. they're not going to... Walmart is the third uh, biggest selling site on the web. Amazon being the first, eBay running second. Okay, next question please. Yes? When you say the drive from corporates to uh, get down price, the real drive to get down price is the consumer. Right. <coughs> All I, these companies are just re responding to consumer demand. That's right. That's bullshit. Charlie, <laughs> one, one dollar, one vote. The best the one dollar, one vote. Uh, vote early, vote often. The more votes you give a company by buying their products, they're going to grow. Those ones that you don't give your dollars to are not going to grow. Remember, Capitalism is the most democratic system in the world. You can buy wherever you want, whatever you want, when you want it, and you can make the money where you want and when you want it. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. According to him, do you think the customers demand to purchase products made by children in sweatshops in Asia? That's customer demand. What customer demand? They're buying it already, that? so obviously. What customer demands that? They're buying it already, Charlie. And when, the, like I said before, sweatshops is an integral part of getting a country well, prosperous. Well, guys, talk and gloss over these facts. No, so I'm not going to talk, talk over or gloss over these well, things. You see, child labor has been banned in Vietnam. Child labor has been um, basically out, outmoded as a country to grow when they get more awareness of the facts of their workers and they start getting it better. Certainly, is a child better in a peasant field with growing rice? which is what you're advocating, they're better off sometimes when they reach a certain age, they're better off sometimes in a factory. I doubt that. Well, and then, like I said, and a lot of them then grow out of the factory deal. Yes? Uh, how do you account for uh, a system that expands constantly in a finite world? I... I think that capitalism will survive. It doesn't have to expand infinitely. As the market, sh as the market will shrink, companies will go bankrupt, and people will find other things to do. Um, this myth about constant growth, you know, we've, we've seen it. But there's right now in the world, there is still plenty of room for growth. There are still many countries out there that want to get to our level of of, of, of our standard of living. And remember, since the Industrial Revolution, it's taken a little while for us in the United States to get prosperous. But look what information technology can do in a place like Taiwan. Virtually overnight, 
they became one of the most richest places on earth. Um, and with globalization, you know, you also have specialization in various countries. What Adam Smith says, do what you're good at and you'll prosper. Have I answered your question? I, I just know that uh, the model calls for consistent growth, new markets, new things, but don't forget at the other end are bankruptcies, business downsizings, uh, less efficient ways of doing things. It's still a dynamic an innovative system that basically can get a country out of poverty quickly. Mm. And it's still the best way I know. Charlie, you know, capitalism may not be the best system in the world, but it's better than all the rest. Okay. I okay, I know I, we're gonna answer one more question from you. What else? Um, I wonder if you'd explain uh, Carbon credits, where um, the jungle is um, burned down or cut down so that people could put farms there and then they get carbon credits for putting, uh, for growing green things that take carbon out of the air when they just cut down the jungle. That's something I don't really know of. I've heard of carbon credits being bought by corporations through forests and things like that to offset their emissions, and that there was an emerging carbon credit market. But as far as what you're specifically referring to, I am sorry, I just don't have knowledge of it. Okay, yes, Charlie. They're selling the virtues of capitalism, and you have no concept whatsoever that it may have harmful effects on the earth. I know what its harmful effects are. You have no idea. And you know something else? When, co when, when companies don't account for the externalities of doing business, like the free roads we use and, and other things like that, even Milton Friedman uh, said, if a business is to truly carry its own weight, it has to take into account the externalities. Like if it's polluting or using dangerous chemicals, the cost to clean it up must also be incurred by that company so they do no harm to their neighbors or anybody else. That's what ideally you'd like to get. But what we've got today is a lot of special favors to corporations by government. And what that simply means is a Walmart comes into an area, they get 10 years of tax increment financing or no property taxes. And when they get their 10th year and they're supposed to pay their taxes, the store closes down and moves to the next town where it's there after decimating the retailers. That's capitalism. There's, that's not capitalism. That's called crony capitalism. And it's called, uh, it's called special favors given by the government to corporations. And that's exactly what Adam Smith also railed against. Monopolistic practice. Monopolist, yeah, you're right. Yes, Karina. Uh, Sears was a major, massive retailer. Sears went down. Is that a singular example, or are there any other Sears that are uh, going I, to go down? I honestly, Karina, I focus most on Sears because it's what we know around the Chicago area. I mean, I'm, I drive by Hoffman Estates every day, right where that Sears Holdings headquarters is. Mm -hmm. And they're a shell of their former selves. But again, I think what may be, what may happen is that when you get big and you get bureaucratic, and I think the same thing's going to happen to Amazon in about 20 years or so, they'll be so big and so brutal and whatnot that uh, they'll, probably less than 20 years that another competitor will come up and take their market share. And in a sense today, it's... Amazon also serves as a marketplace for a lot of online sellers, too. But the thing is, if you get too good a product, Amazon then goes out and they buy the product from the exact same supplier at a discounted price, and then they're selling your product at a So you don't price. anticipate any other retailers going down, or you don't think there's any there's other There's going to be retailers going down. I just can't really tell you specifically by name or by home. There's a good okay. Wikipedia article called Retail Apocalypse that lists. Okay, that's, that's good. We can take a look at it on the web. Okay. Thank you. 
All right. Is it, isn't the eBay a competitor with the Amazon? eBay is a competitor, and the reason I didn't mention eBay again was because of the length of the speech. I wanted to keep it short, keep times for questions. eBay was founded by Paul Lovidiar, and I work on putting items up on eBay every day, answering customer questions, and making sure that our online selling reputation on eBay is good, and that if there's any problems, they're addressed quickly. Um, but they are competitor <laughs> to Amazon. They are a competitor to Amazon because a lot of their listings now are fixed price and not auctions. But you also have to remember, eBay does not own any of its stock or merchandise. It's all done through sellers on the, on this, on the site. So there's no direct competition with eBay itself. All right, Charlie, this will be our last question. Yeah, so you made the assertion several times that capitalism works. Yet you describe a situation where employees, regardless of where they work, are going to face periods of unemployment. Yes. Without any, regardless of how hard they work or how hard they try, whatever they put forth, they will suffer misfortune. And you say, this is a system that works. It doesn't work if you're unemployed. And you're guaranteed, it sounds like every single thing you're we were predicting meet current employees will face termination. Why would you embrace a system that's going to fail? Because it fail also innovates. It also is very dynamic. And it also creates on the whole, more jobs than is lost. When you have the good, when you innovate, you're also going to have the bad, like bankruptcy, unemployment, and things like that. A person in a company, if he's in a good one, will usually keep his job for quite a while. If he's in a bad or bad, badly ran company, he's probably going to lose it right away. But it's also the employee's responsibility to get a decent job and work at a decent company, and they can usually do that with a little bit of time in invested. And yes, you work for the government, you were a union rep, and you probably did a very good job in representing employees who had grievances. And that is a good thing because organizations that are big and bureaucratic need that countervailing power to do so. But unions would not be unions without the capitalist companies to hire the workers in the first place. And if you were to go back to a system advocating socialism, uh, we'd all be equal, but we'd all be equally poor. Come to the quick. An inherent feature of capitalism is periods of unemployment in which you're entirely on your own, and good luck. You can expect As it was in the 1890s, yes. But as of today, you have things like unemployment compensation. That's government. That's government. You, like I said, you do need some safety net. Now, why does the company do it? It's called an unemployment tax. I don't recall Tim advocating for anarchy ever. No. Um, gentlemen, you're fired. Let's. Good luck. Best invitation of Trump I've seen in a long time, Charlie. Rebuttals? All right, rebuttals. I'm unions. I'm All right, union. how many people we got coming and wanting to redo rebuttals tonight? Just three? There'll be more. How much? And what time is it now here? 7.41. If somebody can keep time, we can do about maybe five or six minutes each. And we'll uh, How's keep it, it in there. I'll talk to you. All right, and if Heather is around, I'm going to get that. Let me, uh, okay, Paul wants to go first. Let's welcome Paul Racino to the podium so he can go first and uh, let us have a good rule. Oh, I'm sorry, let me blank this out. You know. All right. All right. Yay. 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 I have a, uh, a correction. Quick comment and an explanation. Wow. All right. Microsoft wasn't the first company to do PCs, Apple was. Apple started in 1984, a little bit ahead of Microsoft. Right. Apple was actually micro, micro Apple was actually Microsoft's first big customer. The comment on Montgomery Wards, Macy's. Macy's and Montgomery Wards battled. Um, they're Number one, their big locations, Montgomery Ward in Chicago, Macy's in New York. Macy's in New York was only 
100 square feet of floor space bigger than the Montgomery Wards in Chicago to be the largest um, location. Tim brought me along in case he got into technical trouble. I, I, there was a question on RFID. I just wanted to explain it a little bit. As, as stated, RFID is radio frequency identification. This has been around for many, many, many years. All it is is in the device, there's a small transmitter chip which transmits a code unique to that device or product or whatever. And it's a very, very weak signal. Like I said, it's in your eye pass, because if it was a strong signal, you'd hit more than one of those lanes at a time. So it has to be a weak signal. And then also, since it's a weak signal, the battery will last a long time. And what it's used for in warehouses, in the days before computers and technology, in a warehouse, they had logs and books and stuff showing where everything was, and you would have to man manually write out a shopping list and then manually go and find it. With RFID and a few other technologies, a warehouse worker gets on his little cart or whatever you want to call those things, and he has a basically a tablet with him and it would and he'll upload his shopping list into the tablet and it'll have an earpiece and it'll tell him go to aisle 45 shelf X row C and so he drives to 45 goes down the line to X up to C, and then it says take three. We'll take one and go one, two, three, as he puts it in the basket. And then it'll go show him the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And it's just so much more efficient in a system like that. In a company like Peapod that does online shopping, I worked for uh, WebVan before they went under, and the system, it, it looks a lot like a luggage system. A luggage system in an airport is the same thing. They have tags on the bins, so an order is associated with a tag, and they'll have these big, huge carousels with all the products that they sell on them, and they'll have three to five stations of pickers. The bin will come into the first station for the picker. Now, whatever is, is in that picker's carousel, product one comes up, they grab the quantity and hit next. Product two comes up, they grab the quantity, pick next. When that carousel is done, when they hit next, it, the basket goes away to the next picker. And at the end, it's up. And the, there's a code on there, and along all these <coughs> conveyors, there's little scanners that grab the code. They, pro they probably use RFID these days. But, and, and the code is recorded, so at all times, they know what's in the bucket, where it is, who it's going to, everything is known about it. And that's, that's the use for RFID in um, a warehouse. And RFID is in other things, like you know how you have a credit card, you tap, that's RFID. Uh, a lot of, if you have a um, ID, an entry card, that's RFID. And the RFID is used a lot. And one of the things they, back in the 90s, they were talking, or 2000s, they were talking about using RFID. You put RFID chips on everything in your grocery store. You put them in your cart, bag them up. You have your credit card sitting there with its RFID chip. <coughs> You'll roll right out the door under a scanner, it rings it up, charges it to your card, and you're done. But I, I don't think that ever worked out, but I've seen it. I saw, I saw that on Modern Marvels one time, but uh, I don't think it ever really worked out. RFID is expensive. It's probably going down like any other technology now that it's being used and produced more.
You, you say you put everything in their bag, but what about, you have to individualize. No, no not since it's RFID, RFID it just no. reads all the RFID no. signals. It can be read. It's, not a scan, it's not scanning a physical barcode, it's picking up a radio signal. Even if one is behind the door, there is still a radio Because it has its own yes. unique First of all, I think we should all thank Tim for a wonderful presentation. Oh, boy, Tim! I have an embarrassing confession for a liberal and a Democrat such as myself. I agree with most of it. Um, with regard to the failure of certain stores such as Sears and the other stores on the long list, Wards, some others that you didn't touch on, like uh, Woolworths, Ben Franklin, Kresge's, um, Goldblatt. Goldblatt's, and, and the big department stores like Fields and Weevils. I think these. I think big corporations sometimes. Um, I think these the big corporations sometimes get experience a hardening of the arteries and become resistant to innovation. Yes. I saw this the other night when I went with my brothers to see a movie called Ford vs. Ferrari. Now, I'm not an auto racing fan. They are. But I would hardly recommend this movie even to those of you who are not auto racing fans. You learn a lot by watching this movie. Not only does it tell a great human story in many respects, but you learn that even companies like, well, let's take the Ford Motor Company, which was determined that was going to beat out Ferrari and produce the world's best race cars. They nearly shot themselves in the foot several times. They hired one of the best racing, one of the best automotive engineers in the business, Carol Shelby, to design some of these cars and to bring along with him top people to help him design them and to race them. Yet Carol Shelby's top guy, a guy who I had not heard of before I saw this movie, named um, Ken Miles who was a British immigrant to this country, who was an excellent automotive designer and a superb race car driver, the Ford Motor Company said, well, he doesn't fit our image as to what a race car driver should be, and he almost, yeah. yet he was the one who helped lead them to victory at Le Mans. And it would have been nice if Henry Ford II had said to, like, said to his racing director, well, look, Ken Miles' approach to getting results may be a little unorthodox, but he gets results, as Richard J. Daly, the mayor of Chicago, put it, what trees do you plant? <laughs> That's what I would like to have seen Henry Ford say, say to his racing director. Well, he gave Ken Miles enough of a chance so that they won the race. But still, in the end, he lost it on a technicality to another Ford driver. And it was because of a stunt. I'm not going to tell you what it was. Go see the movie. Because <laughs> it was a stunt that the racing director came up with. And I think that's what happens to these big companies. And that's why I think a lot of these big retailers that we took, whose existence we took for granted when I was growing up, why I think all these people fell by the wayside. And my company, my, or I should say my family, has had its own little brush with Sears. My father worked for a number of years for Sears. Sears got into, decided to go into the art gallery business. Yes, they did. I know. I read about it. They teamed up with Vincent Price, who in addition to being a well-known actor, was also a well-known art collector and art expert. They started the Sears Vincent Price Gallery downtown in North Michigan. And it was in the building that they tore down to make way for Burberry's. And they ran this gallery for a while. They didn't always know what to do with it. They put it in, in the branch of a company that sold like giftware and lamps. And finally, Sears couldn't find, couldn't, couldn't, it didn't really fit in with Sears' operation. They finally, and I don't know how long they got along with, how well they got along with Vincent Price. He eventually pulled out of the whole business and the art gallery disappeared. So it was there for a while. So my dad worked, after that, went to work for Sears for a while, training people how to sell, which he was, it was really good at. So I enjoyed your talk, Tim. I found it very informative. <laughs> Thanks. Next. Tim, very good talk. Really enjoyed it. Very informative. I learned a lot. Um, Bernie Sanders had went to visit the Walmart 
shareholders meeting a few months back, and Walmart all of a sudden decided that it would support legislation for a $15 minimum wage. Now, Walmart isn't supporting this legislation because they got a conscience all of a sudden because Bernie Sanders changed their mind. They're doing that because they know that it'll impose higher labor costs on smaller companies and that they would just absorb their business. So big corporations like Walmart support these minimum wage hikes because it'll just help them cut out the competition. Now while you Bernie Sanders fans out there, uh, instead of donating to his campaign, what you guys you should probably do instead is pull all your resources together to a pot and maybe buy stock in Walmart or Amazon or any of these other companies because uh, when you think about it buying stock in a company is kind of like the literal definition of socialism it's workers owning the means of production so I think you'd be a lot I think you'd be a lot I think you can affect society better by maybe going buying stock in a company going to shareholders meetings and then trying to uh, do reforms at shareholders' meetings through private, uncoercive means instead of whatever Commissar Sanders thinks is good. So, and if you got a government pension because uh, you couldn't do anything productive with life and got a government job, <laughs> and you got a pension uh, that we're paying for, you should also uh, put that money into stock and effect change that way or give it back to the taxpayers who are paying for that at the peril of the gun. Thank you. Next. We've got more with Shirley. Uh, the welfare of a company like Ford and Ford is kind of producing raising cars. She's coming. Producing raising cars. You coming to rebut? Okay. Who's, who's next? Charlie. Yeah. Right. Anybody next? We got an open mic for rebuttals. Are we through tonight? You want to gallow us out? Yeah. Oh, he's the buddy. Oh, boy. Dave. Just well, relax, Corinne. You can get up here in a minute. The last comment I wanted to make, and should have said earlier, was when we went to the movies um, the other night to see Ford versus Ferrari, the theater is located in Michigan City in Marquette Mall. And this used to be a big old shopping mall with lots of stores. The mall is a shadow of its former self. Pennies and a whole bunch of the other stores are closed. The, the only the few things that are still open there are the movie theaters, the um, the Asian Fusion restaurant where we had a nice dinner, and what else? The local GMC store. Okay. GMC store. Who's next? They sell cars. No, cars. general nutrition. I'd like to thank Tim for a superb uh, presentation. Um, I think that uh, I was born in 1972, and so I think that there's some markers for Generation X, and I think one of them is being a mall rat, and that was what we were called uh, in Northern New England. I come from Massachusetts, and mall rat were people who hung out at the mall. Um, I was in a suburb of Boston, and instead of joyriding, we kind of were mall rats and hung out at the mall. That was then, and I think now, although some malls are starting to revive, particularly with Latina communities, uh, there have been some revol revivals of uh, malls, turning them into very family-friendly gathering spots that are kind of stores slash amusement park places with maybe some music or some entertainment and um, um, yeah I, um, I, I I do think that there's going to be more Sears stores uh, coming down uh, RFID the price has to go down before anyone grossly adopts it um, Walmart can afford it, but uh, really, right now, the in this at this current date, the big king is still barcodes uh, instead of our um, FID. 
Um, I would like to see Walmart continue doing more to drive down prescription prices. So it'd be nice if you could have a Walmart um, produce though. insulin or um, some of these other relatively common and older pharmaceuticals that all of a sudden jack up uh, prices. Uh, EpiPens are $100. It would be great to have a Walmart create an EpiPen or market out an EpiPen that's much cheaper. So. Um, I think that's all I had to say. I had nothing really profound to say. Thanks. Thank you. Um, somebody mentioned uh, good social practices to buy stocks. Here's some recommended great recommendations for stocks. You want to make a ton of money? Buy the EpiPen. <laughs> Now, they charge how much for those needles? They're, you it's make a ton technology. of money. Really um, you know, you could, uh, some other companies, uh, uh, Enron, there's a great company. Mm -hmm. You'll make a ton of money. Or uh, Arthur Anderson or uh, Bear Stearns. <laughs> there's some just terrific, if you want to make a killing, because, you know, that's a great, honest way to make money, <laughs> is to invest in the stock market, right? There's not, that's not a rigged system. So um, I, I like the information on um, on uh, Sears, and I appreciate the talk. Uh, I do have some uh, uh, bones to pick, though. Um, you know, the, in, in general, uh, Tim's approach seems to be that uh, uh, capitalism is this wonderful uh, system, and uh, and we should just not restrict it much. And uh, the laissez-faire thing is uh, the laissez-faire approach. I just don't think it's uh, I just don't think it's fair. Uh, we tend to look with uh, um, these uh, blinders on at this wonderful experience we've had economically in the U.S. in the second half of the 20th century, and I think a lot of people like to just say, oh, it's because this, our system is just terrific. This wonderful economic capitalistic system. And we forget that the reason that we did so well is because there was this little thing called World War II that basically destroyed all the competition. Yeah. So here we are, the only country in the world, the industrialized country in the world that can make stuff. And we are shipping stuff overseas, and we are buying stuff left and right, and we have a ton of money to spend, and, and union wages are skyrocketing, and wages are skyrocketing, profits are everywhere, and there are other people that are just scrambling to stay alive in, uh, in the, the war-torn countries in Europe and Asia. And, you know, capitalism is not, it, it's not magic. It's not this magic thing that happened. Um, uh, I mentioned homelessness. Uh, if, um, if capitalism is so great, why do we have homelessness? And, and I think uh, Tim kind of uh, used some, cherry pick some examples. Uh, from what I've read about homelessness, there are three things that uh, deal with homelessness and uh, uh, that cause homelessness. One is uh, a huge problem right now is the, the opioid crisis. The opioid crisis is driving people into financial ruin and uh, homelessness. And, um, and then you also have uh, the poor access to social services that help drug addicts. Uh, the second thing is, uh, and we can thank Ronald Reagan for a lot of this, is uh, the really poor access to mental health care. There are a lot of people who are just basically given a bottle of pills and drug, dropped in the streets and don't have the capacity to take care of themselves. They fall into that trap. But the third thing is, is there are a lot more people, more and more and more people, are living on this economic margin. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They're driving to work. Uh, and, but if they get hit by a broken transmission or by a huge gas bill or they have to take their kid to the hospital and now the hospital is threatening to push them into bankruptcy because they won't pay their bill. There are a ton of people who are living on the margins. The, the real estate market was, part of the, was, was an example of what happens when people just live on the edge. People were, couldn't pay their mortgages and they couldn't sell. 
now they're showing that that's happening with car mortgages, with the car loans. There are a lot of people who are behind on their car loans. Um, and this is, voila, supposed to be the, the shining example of capitalism, this country. Tremendous amount of homelessness, and a lot of it has to do with too many people, more and more people living on the economic margins. Um, and as for the best, uh, I'm not sure if Andrew Yang said this. He's been talking about this, but uh, I read about this. I forgot who said it. But they basically said the problem with uh, trying to identify if this is a great system is we're counting the wrong numbers. Everybody looks at gross natural product. But gross national product, if you look at that, gosh, the United States is doing great. But if you ask all these kids who are protesting in the streets, what are they saying? They're saying, we don't have a future. Global warming is going to cause, cause global chaos. Is global warming, is that in any way captured by a gross national product? No. They're counting the wrong numbers. They're not considering things like environmental costs, uh, uh, the exploitation of li limited natural resources, oh, any kind of pollution is not covered in the economic numbers. They don't even honestly count unemployment. They're, if, if they, they've got this magic definition and there are a whole group of people who are unemployed, but they're not counted. And the other thing, they look at war as a business. That's something that they do count. They, oh, how many tanks did, uh, how many tanks did they build? How many guns did they build? Any kind of product, oh, this is great. Whoa, let's try to sell this stuff overseas. Why are we counting, why are we considering war as a business? It's, it's not. It's no surprise that stockholders and people want war. It's good for business. Um, I think that the big problem with, with Tim is that when he, he looks at one, he cherry picks one thing. He says, capitalism is great for the world because look at all the abject poverty that's being reduced in the world. But he doesn't look at the other areas of uh, people and how they're affected. How does it affect the middle class in the world? In the United States, the middle class is shrinking. Um, how, does it ex how does it affect the rich? Are there more rich people? Are there less rich people? I can tell you one thing that's, uh, that's happening is that there's this body of super rich people. And they're doing really well. There's not a whole bunch of them. There's less of them. Because more and more, they have these individuals like Jeff Bezos in Amazon, who's taking over, he's taking over the sale of uh, retail. He's got his hands in retail around the world. And I'm like, how is this how is this better? So is there less abject poverty? Maybe. But then you have all these immensely economically powerful people who are having to say over over people's lives, and I think it's having a terrible impact. I, I'm all for capitalism, not against capitalism, but I do not into laissez faire capitalism. I think that I'm a utilitarian, and I think that you need to look at what's the, what has the most benefit for the most people. And the only way to control the, the, something like the Rockefellers, who came in 150 years ago and became one of the richest people in the world, the only way to do that is you set up laws. And you try to take an unfair system. And capitalism is an unfair system. The powerful game the system. And, you, and if you don't set up rules to keep them from gaining the system, you're going to screw a lot of people. Thanks. I'll take the next one here because I'd like to follow up on uh, what our previous speaker just said. Um, there's a ton of information in books that's not in the mainstream media. And if you only look at what's promoted by the mainstream media, as Tim did tonight, gave us a really good presentation of uh, the increasing prosperity of a number of people over the last 
uh, 70 years since World War II. Uh, from 1945 to 73, we had a thriving middle class growing in this country driven by capitalism, but uh, there were some socialist programs in there. Universal, basically, we had uh, the GI Bill. Anybody that served in the Army got a free education. Uh, you know, Things were getting better in America until 1973 when we had the oil embargo and Lewis Powell put out the memo to the Wall Street uh, people that are part of the Chamber of Commerce and said, the middle class is growing too much. They're getting too wealthy and sooner or later they're going to think that they're, they're entitled to a decent standard of living for everybody. They have too much wealth. we got to start taking it back. That's 1973. And... Um, since then, 1980, we started with what's called 40 years now of Reaganomics. Shovel money to the rich at the top and some of it will trickle down to the bottom. That's the ultimate form of unregulated capitalism. Canadian John McMurtry, Professor McMurtry, published a book in 1997 called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And he said we're entering into the final stage. Unregulated capitalism We'll get, well, you'll see some billionaires that rise to the top and have ungodly amounts of wealth, more than they can spend. They'll get big like sharks, and they'll just eat everything in sight and destroy a country. And that is exactly what we're seeing in America now in other countries around the world that have uh, allowed uh, unregulated laissez-faire capitalism to uh, proliferate. As far as the RFID electric electronic technology goes, the only way you can hope for a future where everything is controlled by electronics, microchips, and uh, invisible radiation, and microwaves, and everything else, is if you've never read a book called Brill Power, or never studied the effects of one nuclear bomb exploded above Nebraska 250 miles up in orbit. One electronic pulse going out will fry microchips for hundreds of miles in every direction. What would the stores and what was Amazon be like and everything else if suddenly the whole electronic system just goes down? We'd be in the stone ages. If people weren't doing the work anymore, we were dependent on computers for everything. Sounds like a jobs program to me. The, uh, it's exactly what it is. Uh, an economy based on consumerism, based on growth, is a prescription for the extinction of the human race. There's just no other way to say it. And there's dozens of books, probably several hundred books published in different languages talking about this. There was a book called, for those of you that may, been, may not have been alive in 1970 with the early Earth Day movement, there was a classic book called The Limits to Growth published. And we live on a, a, the planet doesn't have unlimited resources. Capitalism is based on growth all the time, new resources. And when you reach the wall, where there's no more resources to burn or anything else, then you start a decline. And also, Thomas Piketty wrote a book. Has anybody read Thomas Piketty's book from France about capitalism? He talked about capitalism, the, the definition of a capitalist system is boom and bust. Boom cycles where the rich get rich and everybody's doing well, and then a, uh, a, a depression where the rich buy up things for pennies on the dollar and they consolidate their wealth more. Then they bail out certain things, we come out of it, and then we have economic growth for the middle classes or the lower classes for a few years again. It's boom and bust, boom and bust. That is the definition of what we call capitalism, and nobody wants to talk about it. I'd like to talk about light bulb moments for a minute, because uh, you can go along believing something until you have a light bulb moment. If any of you, anybody here ever seen the classic movie In the Heat of the Night with Rod Steiger? Anybody familiar with that? Sidney Poitier played a lieutenant. Rod Steiger was a police sheriff in a southern town. Sidney is driving, uh, traveling through there on train. He gets off to visit his grandmother or something. And Sidney is a Philadelphia police detective. He's dressed in a suit and a tie, but he gets picked up as a black man. Supposedly, there was a crime committed and somebody was murdered outside of town. And the sheriff, played by Rod Steiger, Rod Steiger he says, I have, the, I have the, the motive, you know, uh, the, the deputy, Sam, 
Sam was a deputy, he, he was on patrol in that area where the murder happened. And Rod Steiger says Sam must have done it because he recently made a deposit in his bank account of $600 and the man was shot with a gun, same caliber as Sam. So, you know, Sidney says, Sam, Sam's not the man. You have the wrong man in jail. And, and the sheriff is turning purple and he says, I got the body, I got the motive, I got the gun. I, I know what's happening. And, and Sidney just looks at him like this and he says, Sam couldn't have driven two cars. Right. And there's a light bulb moment going on. And for a lot of people, a light bulb moment happened in 1967 when they found out that the nuclear power industry had planned the best safety record they could hope for was one Chernobyl per year on American soil in exchange for cheap electricity for everybody else. We didn't call it a Chernobyl back then, we called it a meltdown. They thought we would absorb one Chernobyl per year and just fence off a 10 square, 100 square mile, call it a national sacrifice zone, and we're back in business. This is the thinking of modern capitalists that are going for the profits without looking totally at the total side effects of everything. Chernobyl happened in the communist country. Well, Chernobyl, uh, Chernobyl could happen anywhere. It's not where it happened. And, you know, to, to say that Chernobyl can't happen here is to be terrifyingly ignorant of the basic facts. And when people live in a bubble of ignorance, when people live in a bubble of ignorance on any subject, they can be well educated on all kinds of things. But if you're ignorant on a subject that has these built in, it's like, like hiring a new employee. The company hires a new employee, says he's doing great. He's been with us for four months now. And somebody comes up along and says, he's a great employee. Yeah, but did you know he kills one woman a month as a serial killer? <laughs> Hello? Uh, you know, other than that, he's, he's doing a great job for us. Should, should we blow the whistle on him? Or as long as he doesn't kill any of our employees, you know, capitalism has these embedded things in it that, that rank right up there, like saying, you know, as I said before, well, other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how is your trip to Dallas? There you go. Uh, if you look at both sides, you look at the forensic evidence that's published in thousands of places, you have a different worldview. And the, uh, if, if you log on to ex uh, the Extinction Rebellion, incidentally, is doing a good job educating the public on what's happening with capitalism out in the free world today. Sorry. Extinction Rebellion and, and the other student groups, there's well, just dozens of them. There's estimated to be 8 million students in 150 countries that are out of school every Friday now. Every Friday, summer, winter, all year long, college students are leaving college and joining the movement, uh, just growing week by week. So if we don't do something about unregulated capitalism and, and the global warming problem, climate change, it's a crisis now. These kids have no future beyond 2050, no viable future. A lot of them would be, be lucky to survive in 2070 in the conditions that are coming. So we, we continue to ignore this huge body of evidence at our own peril. Solutions are everywhere, but we can't keep burying our heads in the sands and pretending that everything's fine like it was growing up 30, 40 years ago. Things aren't fine, and we, we need to get moving now. Thank you. All right. Let's see, we got a lot to cover here. All right, let's thank our speaker for a nice presentation. Once again, I'll be eclectic as usual. Um, a lot of this is, none of this is new. Um, does anybody know what REA stands for, Railway Express Agency? The, um, the railroads operated, uh, he's cutting me back for some reason. Too loud, don't shout in the mic. The, um, the, they operated a system of 22 agents, 22,000 agents who operated out of stations. You could ship anywhere in the United States. Um, there are two levels of service. Uh, there was express, which was five days or less, or regular express, uh, which was seven to ten days. Uh, the other option you had was the U.S. Post Office began in 1913. You could sit parcel post if it was under 11 pounds. That usually took several weeks, though. So, 
the nation was supplied by uh, the railway express agencies and did quite well. Quite a simple system. As a matter of fact, they picked up packages. If you wanted anything sent, the central feature of REA was that they would come to your home or your business and pick up the item. <coughs> they have a real simple system. They issue an invoice, a waybill, and a label. And uh, depending on the level of service, in the railroads that's called LCL, less than carload lot, less than a, a, uh, a boxcar in essence. And these were attached to passenger trains. Some of the items were shipped, if, if that's what I mean, the express things went by the, according to the passenger trains, if you paid less, <coughs> it went under standard freight railroad traffic. And REA was owned by all the railroads, were the owners of it. And quite frankly, this is this operated, this is how Sears Roebuck operated, Montgomery Ward, and I don't perceive any difference whatsoever on ordering from a Sears catalog and ordering from a computer terminal. And the process is entirely the same. And the order went to a warehouse in some location, and then the item was shipped to, for delivery, which is identical. Now, we were doing this at going back to the turn of the century. They were doing actually better service in the sense that they had pickup and delivery. So they were actually offering service better in years past. Um, the, uh, it was discontinued though. Uh, there were a number of reasons. And UPS, the uh, trucking industry largely came in and took a, a bit of the business away. And then UPS and uh, the, uh, what is the other outfit? FedEx. FedEx came in uh, for interstate commerce. Um, so that was basically it. We had this 100 years ago. Nothing new. We can offer the same service. I don't, you talk about innovation. What are they innovating? You, know, you talk about high tech. What do you need high tech for? They, <laughs> they shipped everything in the United States using it in three pieces of paper. And they did adequately well. It functioned. It was only external factors uh, that precluded uh, some from going from out of, out of operation. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I said to jump around a little bit, this whole thing about Fight for 15 began actually as a Fight for 15 among people in the retail industry. The very first protest I was at it was on Michigan Avenue just before Christmas and with the clerks employed in the retail stores. It's since been transferred. Now this is many, many, quite a few years ago. I still got the sign, I remember. I went to it and all oh, the great innovation, only now uh, they might be getting $15. This shows you how, it's, it should, I've read figures, the figure is more like, uh, if you were realistically speaking, a figure of $28 per hour would be adequate compensation. I don't know the scheme of buying stock uh, in these corporations. I'm sorry, that is the last thing I'm going to do with any funds that we have, is to give, I'm going to give my money to some capitalist, you know, but you who's most likely time. going to declare bankruptcy and give himself a golden parachute and disappear. This is, this is what, this is what's a dance. Come on, this is the College of Complex. It's not, this is not the College of Fools. I'm going to give money to a capitalist to, to, exploit, to, to what, exploit me? <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. Uh, regarding racing, I have no desire. I don't know what the, what's the fascination of racing in, in the first place. They go around in different colors, you and then they come around again, attention, and then they do it a third time. After you've seen them go around once, why do you stay there? I think he finds a uh, firing squad execution to be irritating. No, he wasn't yeah. paying attention. I never, I said I didn't, I wasn't interested in racing. 
Well, well, it's not what really Join fists in an, an eternal combustion yeah, automobile. What's the, what's the goal of that? I don't know. No. Um, Tim seems to forget that, you know, I somewhere, I'm not, I'm not a businessman economist, but there seems to be somebody one time told me there's something called a supply chain. And guess what? Goods don't drop out of the sky. You know, they have a beginning. Uh, and somehow they arrive here. Now, to many people, it's unimportant how they got here. I mean, if it's made by children and they're under less than ideal conditions without any compensation, hey, no big deal. As long as I have the gift to put under the tree and make my relatives or girlfriend happy, right? Uh, that seems to be the objective criteria that's used. But, um, no, the, I, I don't know what the change is in this. I do know that there's been no advances, however. They're more concerned about advances in delivery and, and keeping costs down and so forth. But there's no advances for the people who, who operate and bring about these operations. They, all the literature that I read is that the employees are, are treated like robots. And I still like the story at one of these facilities. It was it got rather hot in the warehouse, and they heated in the course of the summer. And what fans they had available, they put on the robotic equipment instead of the employees, because they found the robots were infinitely more expensive or valuable than the employees. The other thing is that these warehouse workers. Not only, here's the other thing, you don't, you don't have any kind of position. Actually, I actually heard the other thing, that Sears was too generous with their employees. This, this is a problem. With the, they, they were too generous with their employees. This is, this is an error. You know, uh, one more thing, uh, the, um, uh, I lost track here. The, um, Andy, you're into eight minutes, Charlie. <laughs> All right, Andy. I'll let you go then. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Getting him out Good luck. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> well, would you uh, do me the favor of, um, for the sake of our Toastmasters audience listening online? No, you don't want me to do that. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Uh, oh, you don't want to evaluate the case? I do, but I want to do it privately. Okay, is that bad? It would be embarrassing. All right, well, I can understand it. I'll just say this then. Um, I gave a good speech, I thought, but I did do a lot more reading than extemporaneous speaking on that speech. That is the thing I think Paul was going to come into. Um, I found it uh, very tough to cover some of the topics, and especially because I had a long, much longer presentation. I basically stuck to what I knew. And I, I will not say any more because you heard me in the question and answer period and during the rebuttals and, and everything else. Thank you for attending the college tonight. We'll get a little early. And thank you very much for attending. And I appreciate all of you. All right.